we tell our students life is very serendipity, that you get to college and um, you have no idea really what you're interested in, or you may be interested in something, but you find a professor who you just love his or her work, you love his or her classes, this person is incredibly exciting to you, and somehow you become engaged in that professor's work or that professor's intellectual pursuits, and you too pursue that, and that's exactly what happened to me. When I actually began working on my dissertation, what I started focusing on was the relationship between the president and his cabinet. And how does the president and the cabinet interact? And where really is the power? Is it in the executive agencies and policy making, or is it actually in the White House? So I wrote my dissertation on examining that question. I wrote a couple of books when I first started. Our president, Charlie Glassick, asked me to get involved in Eisenhower. And I ran, in, in some years ago, the Eisenhower International Symposium and got really deeply involved in the Eisenhower legacy for some years and wrote two books um, on the Eisenhower presidency. I wrote a book called Power Sharing. And Power Sharing focused on how, what is the relationship between the president and his White House staff and all of those departments, and how is power shared? And uh, the conclusion of that book is power is not shared. Power is dominated by the, by the White House, for better or worse. But actually, I concluded at that point, and I will go on a little bit because I've changed my mind, because <laughs> this was 20 years ago, uh, that, that power should be concentrated in one place because there needs to be some coordination of, the, of, of both domestic and foreign policy, and the White House is the sensible place to do that. Because in reality, all of these little cabinet departments are fiefdom, fighting for their own budgets, fighting for their own agendas, and yet the agenda that should be prioritized is the president's agenda, and only the White House staff, who have no other allegiance, uh, can provide that kind of guidance. So I was a strong believer in my early books uh, on the White House staff controlling policy. Um, that, to some degree, has changed in recent years as I see a little too much control being exerted by the White House staff. A few years ago, uh, I decided to move out of, um, out of this concept of White House cabinet relations and, and go into a broader area. And that broader area is a book that I wrote called um, The Keys to Power, Managing the Presidency. And the Keys to Power Managing the Presidency examines what keys a president needs to have uh, in order to adequately manage this huge government organization with over three million people in it, all vying for their own piece of the pie. So in, in my book, The Keys to Power Managing the Presidency, I have been arguing, I argued very strongly, and it, it's come out uh, came out first in 2000 and a second edition, an updated edition for the Bush presidency, uh, came out in 2005, that this book argues very strongly that the president needs to control the policy agenda, but needs to work very closely uh, with the departments. A book I'm currently working on on the Bush White House um, examines perhaps um, how the Bush administration has gone even further than any administration since the Nixon administration, in that it is very tightly trying to control policy. And this tightly controlled policy has had uh, a number of, of, of problems. And to some extent, the problems that this administration has faced in moving its policies forward has been completely overshadowed by the war in Iraq, because the American public doesn't know all the stumbling blocks that the administration has faced between the White House and the departments. I teach courses on presidential decision making. And um, I teach a broad course on the American presidency, which starts out talking about what are the constitutional powers of the president. We actually read the Constitution. We read Article II in depth. 
And what you find in Article II of the Constitution is, in fact, the President has almost no constitutional authority. What gives George Bush, for instance, this broad constitutional authority is what he takes, perhaps others haven't quite agreed with him, in the oath of office. And the oath of office says that the President will uh, protect and defend the Constitution. And President Bush believes that gives him broad authority to do lots of different things, to protect and defend. Um, so we begin the course talking about what are the constitutional uh, prerogatives of the president, what are the implied powers, what are the explicit powers. I love writing books. I, I love writing books because they enable you to really explore subject matter and to really seriously contribute to the um, intellectual debate. And that's what we as academics do. We want to contribute to the intellectual debate and, and let others continue that, that debate. You want to nurture, you want to foster discussion. Um, writing books enables me to get in depth on a subject matter. Um, so I, I, uh, I, like to, I like to write books. And I, one of the things about you writing books is that it enables me to bring my students into it that my students are deeply engaged in, in all of my books, have been part of every single one of my books. Um, they do um, a tremendous amount of research for me. They do when we do editing. Writing a book is a very complicated process. It involves first developing an idea and, and re refocusing that idea over and over again as you become more deeply engaged in the matter. And then once you, f you finally think, well, this is probably where I'm going, beginning an enormous amount of data gathering. In my case, I do an enormous amount of interviewing. Um, I go to the White House. I go meet with various people in Washington. Uh, I go all over the country to interview people to understand how things happen and why. Students here at Gettysburg are absolutely wonderful. Going, truly going into class is a, is a wonderful experience because not a day goes by that you don't walk in and you see smiling faces truly eager to learn. And I, I know that sounds like puffery and it's truly not meant to be because um, this is just a great, great place. And students are eager to learn. There is nothing more exciting for me as a teacher than to go in in the morning and, and, and come up with what I think is a good lecture, an up-to-date lecture, material that is, that is, that is uh, cutting edge intellectually and, and cutting edge as far as what's going on in the world today, what's going on in Washington, and making sure that the students make all these connections. And um, then they'll, they'll walk out of class talking about it, they'll stop me in the hall, and um, they'll come up to see me in my office and, and want to pursue it, and, and that's really wonderful. Yeah, we teach a, a freshman seminar, and I teach a seminar called um, Conflict and Consensus in American Politics, and it's a, it's a great seminar. It's freshman, uh, first semester, and it's, it's on abortion, affirmative action, and religion, and we talk about these issues because it is very difficult for the American polity to reach a consensus on these three issues. So I, as a presidential scholar, find it even more interesting because what does the president say about when he's running for office about these subjects? It's very difficult. Um, and in what we hope for is that these students leave class and they go to dinner and they go back to their rooms and they talk about these very complex subjects. And remember that for the, these students all have opinions on abortion, on religion, on affirmative action. But generally, they're not their opinions. They're opinions that, that were formed in their churches for them or formed by their parents for them. So the first time they're tackling these uh, on their own and trying to pursue exactly where they stand and understand how, how they fit into, into politics, um, which they're all interested in. So um, yeah, teaching at Gettysburg is wonderful. We are strong believers in internships at this college and experiential learning. And um, we often send our students to do internships in both Harrisburg and the governor's office and in um, the state legislature in Washington. Oh my gosh, Washington is just huge for the numbers of, of internships down there. We also have a, a two wonderful uh, semester-long internship programs. One. 
uh, at American University where uh, I can't, hundreds and hundreds of our students have been, in which they, they do internships in Washington. Uh, one of our students, the students work in the White House, students work in Capitol Hill, students work, we have uh, at least one that I know of right now working for CNN. They work uh, in public interest groups. Um, they work for lobbyists, all sorts of wonderful things.